And I was like looking at this topic and I was like, let me look at it from a different perspective of healing. Not just the same old, same old, you know, the pastor talked about this, we're going to say the same thing again, again, again. It's like, oh, again, another one? No, it's like, Holy Spirit, I want to anchor this teaching this morning, you know? And this morning it was like, I knew that we had this afternoon, but this is what I was going with. And here we are. God's love can heal anything. Are you ready? Now, let's look at the verse. The good neighbor. You know the story of the good neighbor. We've heard that talk before. And you go into the room and then you have the impact of what happens in the room. You know, we've read this many times, but still, it has new meaning for us. It can. And it says here, that a lawyer came up and said, hey, Jesus, Jesus, what do you, what does it take for eternal life? Now, remember lawyers' minds? They're very, you know, they argue the point, right? And their experience with the law, it must say this, it must say that, if not, you're going to be punished. I mean, they're just, you know, very into the you know, argumentative, you know, have you had that many of, you know, if you have a young lawyer, you sit there and argue with a lawyer, you know, and it's just like, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying, the lawyer still has this mind of, tell me, this inquisitive mind, until the lawyer is content with the answer. So, when we're looking at the lawyer's mind, Jesus is cool, cool as, I mean, Jesus is just giving this lawyer, he says, what does it say? What is written in the law? And the lawyer said, you will love the Lord God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your might and all of your strength and mind. And that was the answer. That was the answer. And if you do, that will enhance your life and give you eternal life. And the lawyer said, I'm not content with that answer. And why was that? Because he had his own little checklist going off. Okay, I've already done that. I've done that. I've done that. But there's more, isn't there? And the lawyer says, what? Let's see what he says. Come over here to this side. Now there's this little bit of defensiveness. The, you know, the lawyer thinks he's already got it, right? I got this point proven. I got this other point. I'm ready to go. Come on. I'm just going to, you know, put on this task and see if you've got the right, right response here. He's standing there and he's feeling all smug. And he asks, who's my neighbor? <laughs> Who is my neighbor? Now, again, the lawyer's mind. Think about the lawyer's perspective. He's not really asking. How many times have you looked at what may be written before you? And you're going, wait a minute, there's something missing here. Come on, talk to me. I'm not interested in, you know, I'm all pure and all of that, you know, and the, you know, the, the copy or wrote answer. But how do you feel? How do you feel? You're not following it? Do you feel like you're missing something? Um, what would that be? I feel like it's always before me, just putting it off. I feel like I'm putting it off, or I'm hoping I have the time for it, or, yeah, like that. Any more comments back there? I feel like I have to, not because I want to. Who feels like they have to? Raise your hand. Yeah, we're being honest here. All right, we're being honest. We have to, why? Because if we don't obey, what happens? And you know, we, we got that feeling that we've got to do it from the heart. But sometimes it's from, got to do it from outside, not from inside. It's like, come here and, and match these requirements, and so I've got to follow this, and you know, and I struggle with what I'm supposed to be following. There's always many expectations on us. I mean, like, if we're going through our experiences, when we look at the law, and we're talking about, 
you know, our experiences. It could be the same thing. There's a different way here. There's a different area there. There's a different situation here. The stories may be different, but we come back to this. Jesus replied, There's this one man that was walking down the road, walking down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and these group of people beat him up, these robbers and mob beat him up, robbed him, and left him. Just left him to die. Remember, he was half dead. Now, Jesus is telling the story. Now, you see the picture here? Sorry. See the explanation? First came by a priest. Priest does the work of the temple, the worship, the lighting of the candles. And remember, the priest comes in and blesses the temple, right? Sanctifies the temple. And the priest does the practice, comes in, holy, you know, sanctifying the environment with the candles, the incense, everything. Comes in and everything is holy. Remember that. From there going into the access, the priest has to be holy. Or as they enter the holy room, they will be struck down. Remember this. It's serious. It's a serious job being a priest. Every day, they have to check their heart. They have to check their minds. And the priests have what they call the bells. Remember the on the clothes? The ting ting. Remember they, they tie bells along the bottom of the rope. Do you remember why? Because if the, her, the priest heard the bells ringing, that meant that all was well. But if it got quiet, what did that mean? That meant there was a death that happened. And so they would take the rope and they would pull the priest out of the holiest of holies room. Now, that's just the research about what priests had to do, how serious it was about a priest. But let's look at this priest. This priest is going on, and he sees a half-dead man, and he walks away, and walks around him. Now, what about this priest? As you go into the Holy of Holies, and you are before God Almighty, and what about this priest? What about the experiences? Our hearts, holy, keeping our focus ever before God. And as we come into this holy of holies, you know, and, you know, the Israel people, you know, coming, this like, think of that perspective. And yet this priest walks around him and leaves him. Then we have the Levite. The Levite was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, remember? And the Levites were for war? Not at all. They were sanctified. They were set aside to serve God. They were, they were holy servants. Sanctified, set aside. Aaron, remember Aaron, Moses' brother? Aaron, the one that was there with Moses, he was the beginning of the Levite tribe. And the Levite, serving God, walked past this half-dead half dead man. Oh, that scares me. That scares me. No, wait. What about all of this blood? You know, you lose blood, you will die. And he's probably breathing hard. I mean, you can probably see his expression and see him. Please help me. Please help me. What did they see? So, I mean, did they look at his eyes as they were walking past him? Did they have anything to say? I mean, did they even ask them, how did you fall? How did you, you know? And then the Levite as well. And, you know, we don't know where they went, where they were off to in the end. The Samaritan said, oh no, this is, this is like a dirty dog. Now, understand. Let's go over to this slide over here. I want to look at what half-dead looks like. This is 2018, and we're with a group of women. 
How does this apply to us? Many women are, quote, half dead. Let me show you. The domestic violence, drug use, verbal abuse. Some partners, domestic partners, always putting them down, criticizing them, demeaning them. Where's the confidence in that situation? There is no confidence. There's women that experienced rape. And then also hearing families, outcasts from hearing families, they're just always left aside. There's no inclusion, no communication, no involvement at all. The deaf just feels like, wait, I'm left out. So don't a lot of the deaf women feel like outcasts? And then those women with low self-esteem. I know this one beautiful woman. Almost half of what she says is always negative. Always, always negative coming out. And everything she says just kind of hits me and I'm like going, why? <clears throat> and her sister says, because that's all she's ever heard is this is negative and her mind is locked in on this negative. The positive feels funny to her. It feels cheesy to her. And when she's thinking what's normal is that negative thought. That's her first response. And low self-esteem is her norm. From the day she was born, it was hard. And then she becomes a Christian and she's struggling with this. And struggling with depression because of her brain being stuck in the old patterns of that negativity continuing on. Let's look at our list again. Anxiety. Depression and anxiety. I know I'm a Christian, but I still experience anxiety. I, I'm not, you know, maybe it's because I don't have enough faith. Now, wait a minute. We're going to separate that out. What our body chemistry does and the pressure and the stress that we have on our bodies. Oh, my ladies. You know, I mean, it's just some situations when we have our negative thoughts and it's just continually negative. I mean, when we don't want that experience, when we're, coming, when we're trying to work on our mind being more peaceful and trusting, and we're trusting God to take care of it. But then life hits us and we start to worry and go back into that old pattern again. Some worry, it's like, you know, I know we have some worry, you know, like with the children, trust the children to be safe. But then there's others that, I mean, we are just constant in anxiety, out of control. Bad experience. That stuck suffering experience. Feeling like you're in prison. Not experiencing peace is where we're coming from. Not having confidence. Always lacking that. Staying in the negativity and just throwing out. Look at all of these things. Right, but how many women in here and in the world are experiencing these characteristics? Many. Even some of the women in this room. Christian or not Christian, it doesn't matter. You know, we can be a Christian and then at home we can take that mask off and we go back into that negativity. And then when we're at church, we've got that mask of all is well and good. We get home and we're not so happy and we flop back and forth, back and forth. But that struggle, that internal struggle, we can get through it. We can let go and be free. We can. We can cry out and to the joy. We can. Some don't have that. Some haven't had that joy in a long time. But we can. We can still come into that joy, especially here at the church. And it doesn't matter, Christian, it doesn't matter how many years you've been a Christian. You can experience this in your walk, in your day-to-day -day walk. There's no room for the mask. Let's get healed and get that mask off. Why do we, we, are, we deserve to be free. We deserve to be free. You are from the kingdom. You are the king's daughters. Step up into that. Get into that, into the heaven. And just let that fill your soul. You don't have to pay for it. You know, it's like this faith going into the heaven. Heaven gives it whatever you need. Heaven provides. 